Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. It's retro laptop time as we're going to be taking a look at this Philips laptop computer from 1991. A 286 running at 12 megahertz. Now I have a theory on good laptops. If you can open up the hinge with one hand without the bottom part moving, then you're dealing with a good laptop. And this is definitely the case here. Albeit it might be the case for a lot of laptops from those days. If you compare it with its contemporaries, you will see that they are a lot bigger, but this one is relatively small. If I compare it to my MacBook 12 inch laptop, it's roughly the same size. And with that, I mean the surface area, obviously not the height of the laptop. We have made a lot of progression on the technical front in that respect, but still, I mean, it's a very nice little laptop. I always think it's fun to compare them against the more modern laptop just to see how things have evolved in terms of screen size, touchpad, the weight of the laptop. But we're not going to be focusing on the MacBook here. We're going to be focusing on this Philips laptop. And this is a Philips PCL200 laptop. Let's take a closer look at the surface. There is some sticky gooey here on the top cover that we will need to clean up at some point because it is very sticky. And on the back we can see that this is an actual PCL203 laptop. So this is the version which comes with a 286 12 megahertz CPU. It has a 1.44 megabyte disk drive. I initially thought that this would be a 720K disk drive, but it appears to be a 1.44 megabyte one. We also have two PS2 connectors here, one for the keyboard and one for the mouse. So that's really convenient that we can use those for an external keyboard and a mouse. Not something that you see on a lot of laptops. We have the power switch here just to power the laptop on and off. If we move to the back, we will see that next to the power input, we have two uh, plastic thingies here that we can take off, which exposes two parallel ports and one serial port. A bit strange to see two parallel ports. And this seems to be some kind of docking connector, I suppose. Here we have the power connector coming from the power supply unit, which goes into this power connector here. So yeah, power connector, two parallel port, it seems, one serial port, because we also have the PS2 ports and uh, what I think is a docking connector port. On the other side, we have a external VGA connector for hooking up a CRT and an optional modem, which isn't installed here. Next to that, we have another cover here, and what is in there appears to be the battery of the laptop. And this is -da, a Varta battery, 4.8 volts, do not throw in fire, from 1995. So I'm guessing this was replaced at some point. But like all Varta batteries, this has started leaking horribly, so we're probably not going to be using that one anymore. So let's open up the laptop where we see a nice little keyboard here. I'm happy to say it is a QWERTY laptop keyboard. We have the function keys here. We have some special keys. Has a nice uh, clicky feel to it. Um, so yeah, really, really nice to see that one here. Now, as with most laptops, we have the FN key, which is a special function key, which will enable certain keys here, like we have Hercules mode, we can stretch the display, auto map, not really sure what that is, but we can set the CPU speed, slow and fast. We can uh, switch to an external display. We have a num lock on the keyboard. But now time to turn on the laptop. So let me hook up the power brick here, insert it into the back of the computer, it goes into standby mode. We flip the power switch and the computer seems to start. It's definitely making a noise. We can hear the hard drive spinning up. And if we look on the screen, we can see the standard, you know, 
uh, BIOS tests which are occurring here. There is an error with the CMOS battery and the checksum, but other than that, all the tests seem to pass. It's only seeing 640 kilobytes, so normally this should come standard with 1 megabytes of RAM, and it can be upgraded up to 8 megabytes of RAM. We also heard a floppy disk initializing, so let's hit F1 to continue, but we get the disk boot failure. Insert system disk and press enter. Now before we continue, I just want to quickly point out we have four status LEDs here, standby, power, floppy drive, and hard drive. And also some of the keys on the keyboard have this built-in LED, which is a nice touch. Now for some reason it isn't starting from the hard drive, so let's boot with an MS-DOS floppy. I happen to have a data general MS-DOS 3.3 floppy disk lying around here. So let's boot this one up because I initially thought that this would be a 720 kilobyte disk drive. So I took that particular disk, but this seems to work with a 1.44 megabyte disk also. But let's just boot into MS-DOS. This is version 3.2. And I just want to load up FDisk to see if it is able to detect the hard drive because perhaps, you know, the disk isn't formatted or something. But we don't get a C prompt. And if we go into FDisk, we get a report that there is no fixed disk present. So yeah, that's a bit of a bummer, but this can still be related to the BIOS not picking up the disk. So let's go into that BIOS by hitting Control alt escape and you can do that from within MS-DOS, you can do that from uh, the boot prompt and it will load up the setup screen. And here we can configure stuff like the date and the time. We have already see that we have an internal disk drive 1.4 megabyte. We have a hard disk option of 20 megabyte. We can configure the hard drive power downtime. I'm going to disable it for now. We see that we have one megabyte of memory size configured in the BIOS. We can toggle that as well. So this seems to go to a maximum of eight megabytes. We can configure standby and power management, display type, monitor type. So I'm guessing this supports like VGA, EGA, CGA, and even Hercules. Don't know what the PS2 monitor type is about, but I'm assuming this is going to be an IBM PS2 type monitor. And then we can have some other uh, screen related settings like uh, width compression, uh, bold fonts, uh, stuff like that. Now let me quickly set the date and the time on this machine. So this is very easily done. And let's go to the hard disk options. So the boot disk was set to internal, but we can also set it to hard disk. Not really sure what the difference is. We can toggle various sizes of the hard disk. I'm guessing this one has a 20 megabyte hard disk inside. So I'm going to leave it at 20 megabytes. Hit F10 to record the changes, F5 to confirm, and then we should be able to reboot. And let's see if it will find the hard drive now. I'm guessing it will not because we didn't really change something. Now this CMOS RAM error and the check battery thing, if this is a Dallas clock type thing, uh, things can get a little bit iffy if you have a dead Dallas uh, chip on the motherboard. So I'm not really too much concerned at this point that there is an issue with the hard drive, but we'll see. Regarding the display of the laptop, we have a 640 by 480 LCD display. We have some keyboard controls where we can configure the brightness and the contrast. And we can also invert the LCD. Instead of having a black background with white text, we can basically invert that so that the black background becomes white and the white text becomes black. So you can toggle between these modes and again configure the brightness and the contrast within these two modes. So all in all, it's a very readable LCD display. I had no issues uh, you know, reading the text. So yeah, that was really nice. Now I did want to load up some software, so luckily I did still have the floppy disk. So let's open up uh, Grand Prix Circuit, which supports various display modes. And this LCD panel does support VGA, EGA, CGA, and Hercules, and MDA. Now playing games on a laptop like this isn't ideal, but it is definitely doable. 
The TFT display with a backlight is sufficient to play some basic games and you can play around with the brightness and the contrast to set the screen to your desire. And here we have some in-game footage. So let's start our little lap here. So yeah, there's a little bit of motion blur as to be expected. It's not going to be the same as on a CRT, but it's definitely playable here on this little screen. And the fact that it's an 8286 CPU instead of, you know, a classic XT, as you saw in the earlier laptops, a lot of games do play very comfortably. But of course, we also have the option to hook up an external CRT monitor, or in this case, I'm going to hook up my LCD panel. The only thing we need to do is hit the FN key and then use the special CRT LCD uh, F10 function key to toggle between the internal LCD and, in this case, the external LCD monitor. Now, obviously, this will bring the usage of this laptop to a whole new level as you can experience the full VGA color palette, although in this particular game it only supports 16 colors in EGA, but you get what I mean. I mean, it's a lot more comfortable to play on a color panel than it is on a monochrome LCD panel. There is no sound card installed in this laptop, obviously, so, you know, you'll have to do with the PC speaker, but at least you can hook up some color. Now, final thing that I wanted to show you guys was Check It version 3. Let's see what this PC diagnostic software can find in terms of this PC. So we'll go to the configuration. So here it has detected the 8286AT machine. Base memory 640K is correct, but the extended memory 21 megabytes seems to be a bit off. Has detected the VGA video adapter, the 1.44 megabyte floppy drive, one parallel port. I thought I saw two on the back, one serial port, and 256 kilobytes of video RAM. Now, when I load up the interrupt assignments, I noticed that IRQ9, which is reserved for the display adapter, was set to VGA, but set to disabled. Now, if you load up the CMOS table, you will see some pretty strange stuff. The date and time is definitely not correct. Both floppy drive A and B are set to type 5. We again see the 22 megabyte of memory, and the primary display seems to be the CGA instead of the VGA. So not really sure what's up with that. In terms of benchmarking the main system, this will obviously be a lot faster than your traditional IBM PC XT because this one is clocked at 12 megahertz. So this is a 286. So this is probably gonna be around seven or eight times faster than an IBM PC XT. So 7.25 times faster. There is no floating point unit installed, but also on that front, it's definitely a lot faster. You can do a video system benchmark as well. Also a lot faster for obvious reasons. Now the laptop isn't really usable without any storage. So in part two, we're gonna be looking at this two and a half inch hard drive that came with the laptop. This is a Connor 20 megabyte hard drive. We're gonna be looking at the internals of the machine. In particular, I have high hopes that replacing this chip will bring the computer back to life. Of course, we also had the mandatory screw up while disassembling this laptop. So this is also going to be fun. I'm going to see if I can clean her up a little bit and see if we can put everything back together again. But until then, I really hope you've enjoyed this first part of the video, a quick uh, look at the laptop. 
If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel if you like this kind of retro content. And I hope to see you guys very soon for part two on this Philip PCL203 retro laptop. Bye-bye.